Good morning and welcome to the, my YouTube channel, Pain Free Partha. Today's topic is about recent anti-diabetic drugs and anesthesia cancers. Whenever I talk anything on academics, I put a big salute to the legendary teacher of two centuries, Professor Ravi Shankar, and greetings from my institute, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute, Sri Balaji Vidya Peet. We all know that New Delhi is the capital of India and India is the capital of diabetes. And that is why we need a topic because there are a lot of drugs going on. Still, what I want to talk in these 15 minutes is all about type 2 diabetes and recent drugs. This is what I am going to concentrate. A perioperative diabetic care will be in a different channel or different slideshow. Here I am going to talk only about type 2 and recent drugs. Not about newer insulins, not about type 1 or gestational diabetes. There were old drugs and there were new drugs. This is called SGLT2 inhibitors. They are called glyphosins. Dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitors, they are called glyptins. There, there are some drugs like colizabellum, amiglimin, semaglutide. These are all old drugs. Sometimes these old drugs may come for new use and new drugs may come for old use also. Now, if you take an operation, surgery, it's also stress. We all know that there is a counter-regulation mechanism. There is steroid increase, catecholamine increase, glucagon increase, growth hormone increase, all these going on to hyperglycemia. Okay? This is about surgical stress. It doesn't stop with this. Now we are adding to this. Our anesthesia causes all these things and causes increased stress. So now we go to the first group of drugs, dryptins. Okay. Now before that, I want to tell what is incretin effect. Now if there is two, if there is one patient A and another patient B, okay, A, B, A patient, we are giving oral glucose and making the sugar, if you take the sugar, as 200, okay. Now, another B patient, we are giving IV glucose and making it the same sugar of 200. Now, what happens in patients where we have given oral glucose, the insulin secretion is high. That is what is called incretin effect. Whenever you achieve the same glycemia, if you give oral an increase, the incretin effect acts and the insulin secretion is higher. This is what is called incretin effect. These incretins are GLP-1 and GLP. These act to stimulate insulin release, inhibit glucagon release. That is why they cause decrease in glucose. They are made not to act. How, how can you act like this? These are certain enzymes which inhibit these incretins. Dipeptidyl peptidase, four inhibitors. Now what we are doing is, we are giving a drug which cuts short this so, incretins are increased, this stimulates insulin release and glucose to be lower. These are called gliptins. Gliptins are dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, thereby they increase the incretins and they act by stimulating the insulin release and they lower the blood glucose. Now, we have cetagliptin, vildagliptin, allogliptin, linagliptin and saxagliptin. Allogliptin, except that I have used all these they are good for the heart. They are good for the liver. They are good for the kidneys. Okay, they are good for the stomach. And they are good for the brain. So, even a mild, some sort of fullness may be there in the stomach. Otherwise, everything is safe with gliptins. Nasal stuffiness, a minimal bloating on initiation. This is the most important thing. Take unconnected with food dating. Gliptins can be taken today at uh, before food and tomorrow after, after food. Whatever it is, it should be taken at the same time. Anytime, if you have missed, don't bother. Take after food also. This is the biggest advantage of gliptins. Can be continued through the preoperative period because we don't bother about food. 
there are some problems with Bipkins where they say NSAIDs and beta blockers may interact with this medication. But in my practice, we have not found anything clinically significant. I continue to use Bipkins and there is no major problem. Now, because it's about Glyptins, Cetaglyptin, Bildaglyptin, all these things we are told. Glyptins has to be continued to the predominant. Yes. Now, we are going to the exact opposite, South Pole of this. That is North Pole, this is South Pole. We are going into Glyphlosins. What are these things? Glyphlosins are sodium glucose co-transport 2 inhibitors. That is called SGLT2 inhibitors. Latest class of anti-hypertase inhibitors. What do they do? They decrease, they act on the proximal convoluted tubule. What do they do? They inhibit SGLT2. What do they do? They get out of this glucose into the UA. And they go out also because it's a sodium glucose or transport. Sodium also goes out. Now, because of the sodium, some amount of potassium is retained. Sodium glucose goes into the urine. Water goes out. Now, again, I'm very clear. Sodium glucose or transporter inhibitors make glucose to go into the urine. Make sodium to go into the urine. That is why it makes water to go into the urine on some compensation. It takes potassium in. Dapaglyphrosin, empaglyphrosin, remaglyphrosin, here to sotaglyphrosins. Any time in diabetes, we can start. Now, for example, on day one of finding out diabetes, after 10 years of finding out diabetes, after 5 years of diabetes, diabetes that is the advantage because. It is independent of insulin because water and fluid goes out. There is a weight loss and there is a BP loss. Less. There are other mechanisms also of SGLT2 inhibitors. Lipid profile betters. That is why the cardiovascular morbidities are less. Renal protection is there with glyphosates. But most of the times they say these protective actions on the organs are due to weight loss, blood pressure loss, less and lipid profile betterment. Possibly these three things act for decreasing the cardiovascular morbidities even though there are some mechanisms proposed for its independent betterment of CV morbidities and renal morbidities. Now they have used to start at use even in non-diabetics. What we need to need about it, urinary infections, sometimes fungal infections, risk of hypoglycemia. We all know sodium loss, water loss, and there is a possible potassium increase, which is not very clinically significant. What do you call as euglycemic ketosis? This is very important in patients taking glyphosins. What are glyphosins? Dapaglyphosins, remaglyphosin, all these things. Glyphosins. We are difficult. Preoperative fluid assessment is difficult. Intraoperative fluid assessment is difficult. Postoperative fluid assessment is difficult. They are in a hypovolumic stage. That is what we should understand. They are in a hypovolumic stage, and they are prone for euglycemic ketosis. Because they decrease insulin, increase glucagon, they cause hypovolemia. All these things, ketone absorption from the urine. Now, these things are prone for ketosis. Now, we have a setting of surgery, anesthesia, infection. Again, they go for ketosis. They may not have sugars of 400, 500. They may have sugars of 200 with ketone bodies. This is very important. That is why glyphosins and euglycemic ketoacidosis in a setting of anesthesia is very important. So we may need to start glyphosins three days prior and no urgency is to start again after surgeries. Now we have two drugs. Glyphosins continue. Glyphosins stop. There is one more drug called colicebellum, a basic bilaxid secretant used in type 2 diabetes. 
and it may decrease the bioavailability of many drugs, steroids, NSAIDs, warfarin, fruzimide, etc. There are a lot of drugs, but what I want to emphasize here is what is concerned more with anesthetics. Polycebellum is a bile acid sequester. Now this medication is taken by mouth, okay? With a meal, usually one to two times. Now, this is mongoose and a snake, okay? Foot and anesthesia are like that. So this drug has to be taken at the foot. So stop the drug. No urgency to restart. Because there is no use. Because the anesthet this anesthetic patient are going to be fasting. Any drug that is going to be taken with food, it is not going to be of significance and it has to be stopped. There is one drug which I am fond of is imiglamin. Now, imiglamin is a novel antidiabetic. Now you can see, inner setting of diabetes mellitus, what happens? There are genetic factors and there are environmental factors. There is a mitochondrial dysfunction. What happens to this mitochondrial dysfunction? beta cell dysfunction and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Now that is what I am important in. Gliflozins don't have anything in insulin. They just pour out urine. Now you see there is imiglamin which targets our basic disease like this. It betters mitochondrial dysfunction. Thereby it is important in countering the pathophysiology of diabetes of insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. Usually I give 500 milligram. It is not very potent. That is what my practice goes. The drug does not come down the sugar from 480 to 200. It comes down from 480 to possibly 350. That is what my practice goes. It is not a very potent drug like glimic pride or something like that. But nausea and vomiting is this. No effect of aspiration. No effect on volume status. Nothing on electrolytes. You can continue the drugs imiglobin. There is one more drug called semaglutide. It is a human analog of GLP-1 RA. This is some sort of incontinence. The starting dose is 3 mg per day for one month. Then you can increase it. Now the problem with semaglutide is it increased gastric symptoms. High risk of aspiration. See the drug again, I am telling you, like that old drug which I told, the drug is taken even for non diabetics. Full stomach. You have to take it as full stomach and rapid sequence injection. We may need to do VSG of a gastric tract. Advanced planning, but still, there are not much of high quality research or RCTs to say that it is a very bad drug. But the problem is. In June 2003, 23, they have said proceed with caution. But the most important advantage in semaglutide is people who own this house in the early sea phase of Mumbai only can purchase, I think, it's 480 per tablet and the retailer price and medical price may come down to 300. Semaglutide need to be stopped completely. Possibly one or two weeks. Now we go to repaglinide. It works by lowering blood glucose by pancreatic cells of potassium inhibition. Channel inhibition. So insulin secretion is promoted. It comes in 1 mg or 2 mg and each food you have to take. So diarrhea and headaches may be severe. So we have to take again with each meal. That means we have to stop that repaglinide. The possibility of URI is there. UTI is there with gliflozins. URI is there with gripaglinide. Vitamin E, C, K, vitamins, all supplements should be stopped a week before. Green tea, ginkgo, all these things may have problems with platelet functions. So stop all vitamins. Vitamin D and anesthesia. Now I am again telling you, this is not the topic about vitamins and diabetes. This is a topic about recent anti-diabetic drugs and anesthetic concerns. But most of these patients are taking all these things. So I am just adding this. Oral magnesium supplementations. But this Maxelf is not equivalent to the dosage of Maxelf, which we commonly use for eclampsia. 
Now this is the problem. The patient may be taking glyphosins, liptins, metformin, miglamide, etc. So gliptin plus glyphosin, gliptin plus metformin, glyphosins plus glimipride with all these combinations the patients may be taking. So we need to stop gliptins. We need to stop glyphosins. We need to continue gliptins. We need to stop glyphosins three days prior. But this may be stopped according to the conditions. Now, if this combination is already there, gliptin, glyphosins, metformin, and if the patient also takes some long-acting insulin, like some whatever it is, lysodic or something like that, what will happen? Now I will show gliptins, good drug, no need to stop. Well, as a venom, stop day before. Hemoglobin can be continued. Semaglutide prior three weeks, aspiration risk and rapid sequence detection. Epiglinite has to be taken. This is what is called, the name comes as prandial. That means it is taken with food. Nazia vomiting one day prior. Cliflozins stop three days prior. Think of hypovolemia. Think of electrolyte balance. And you don't need to start it urgently. And the most important complication is euglymic semic ketoacidosis. So we may need to take ABGs in patients with cliflozin. Take an ABG on day one, post operative, on the day Z also, so that we are sure that there is no ketosis. Always take also one ketone bodies. Any surgery, when the patient comes back to his oral diet, schedule in 24 hours can be considered negative. Now, diabetes carries a separate topic. Still, I want to touch it. Any patient with a big forearm surgery going on for four hours, but the patient takes food in the next three hours is not major surgery in diabetes. Duration and blood loss doesn't matter. But if the patient has got an hysterectomy done with a small bowel adhesions, which finishes within 45 minutes, sometimes it is major surgery in diabetes because the patient cannot go to normal food in the next 24 hours. Must be used when fasting and where food intake is likely to be irregular. See, sometimes we will not, they will not know physicians. The patient would have done an upper dissectomy. But they must have injured, they may have injured the gut. So the patient is on rice tube and IV fluids. Okay. Now if the physician opinion goes and tells, he will not know this intraoperative problem. So we may need to tell that physician, that this is the problem and we cannot start like a routine destructive. So what is the carry home message? Stop gliflosins, stop vitamins, continue gliptins and possibly continue imiglimins. Thank you all. Can be visited in Painfree Park.